All right, I see the participants starting to, uh, to queue up. So uh, I'm gonna get started and I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Rafke. I'm the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And we are delighted to have all of you with us today for uh, a, a really important topic. And that is the intersection of public health and public trust. Um, naturally, over the course of the two plus years of pandemic, the United States and Germany have, uh, well, collected uh, a lot of experience uh, and not all of it positive in uh, how administrations work with the public in, in matters of public health. And so public trust is a crucial component of that. And I'm really delighted we've got a, a great session lined up today to look at in a comparative perspective at uh, the United States and Germany as we have made our way uh, through this uh, really once in a century um, public health challenge. I am now gonna get out of everyone's way and hand things over to our moderator, my colleague, Susanna Dieper, Director of Programs and Grants here at AICGS. And I look forward to the discussion. So Susanna, um, uh, the, uh, the microphone uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our audience and our speakers. It's my pleasure to host this webinar today in a series, The Importance of the Transatlantic Partnership in Times of Global Crises. This program is supported by the Transatlantic Program of the Federal Republic of Germany with funds from the European Recovery Program at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. We look at different issues in the series and we have two excellent speakers today who focus on how the healthcare system in the United States and Germany has managed the COVID-19 pandemic. And as Jeff said, they both are focusing on the issue of trust. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Katrin Löhr. Katrin is a professor of political studies at the University of Applied Sciences in Osnabrück in Germany. Her research focuses on consumer science and consumer policy, public health, energy policy, behavioral policy, policy research, advocacy, lobbying, and civil society organizations. She is a co-spokesperson at the Advisory Board for Consumer Research of the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, nu Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection. She's an expert on policy instruments and health and consumer policy, as well as behavioral pu public policy. And her research also focuses on expert involvement and the role of scientific evidence and policy making. She's co-editor of the book, Behavioral Politics for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, which was published in 2019 and has also published a number of articles in academic, different academic outlets, including the Journal of Comparative Policy Analysis, Public Health and Policy and Politics. Katrin was also a visiting fellow at AICGS in the fall of 2019. We're delighted to have her back. On the US side, we have Marjorie Connolly, who is an independent public health communications consultant who works with the Infectious Diseases Society of America on COVID-19 response. And she currently studies global history at the Humboldt and Freie Universities of Berlin, where she focuses on the conceptual history of universal healthcare. She was a Robert Bosch Foundation Transatlantic Fellow in 2018-2019, and uh, during that time in Germany, she conducted research comparing the German and American health systems. Her career in American health policy has included roles on Capitol Hill and as a spokeswoman for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Ser Services during the Obama administration. Welcome, Marjorie. Both Thank you. Are yeah, both of our speakers will give their presentations, and because they know, they both know the other side very well, they will comment, provide some, some comments on each other's findings and presentations and the, the transatlantic dimension of, of the issues. The audience uh, is welcome to submit your questions through the Q&A function at any time. We will address questions during the later part of the webinar. We'll start 
with the US side and I'll pass the microphone over to Marjorie, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm obviously very excited to be here um, today with AICGS. Thanks to the team over there. Um, and thanks to Dr. Lur um, for joining what should be a really fascinating conversation. Um, so I want to acknowledge for our um, for those who may be joining us from this side of the pond, because I'm actually in Berlin right now, that my career um, to most people who um, who are familiar with the German educational system doesn't really make any sense because I've only just now gone to get my master's degree in global history after first doing um, doing a lot of um, jobs very young in the U.S. Um, on Capitol Hill and in government, which is which is more common in the US than I, I had the wonderful opportunity um, to work at the BAMJ, the German Federal Ministry of Health. Um, and everyone there has really trained for their roles, is, is a professional civil servant, um, and things can be a little, a little more loosey-goosey for, for better or for worse in the United States. Um, but one thing that I've learned in my, in my history studies uh, at the Humboldt and Freie universities it, is that, um, a, a really a new appreciation of lived experience as expertise. And I think we all have a lot of lived experience as members of the public that we shouldn't discount as public communications and public health professionals. Um, so when I was asked to, to, um, to join this session, my first thought was about my lived experience um, in both the United States and Germany during this um, truly unprecedented uh, pandemic, as Jeff mentioned. So I'm going to do something a little unusual after showing this um, chart of confirmed cases and show you uh, a bunch of pictures from that I've taken on my phone, <laughs> um, both in the US and in Germany, um, and talk about, um, as a member of the public, how I have experienced um, public health communication before getting into the more theoretical side of things. Um, so here is a chart um, from our world in data based on John Hopkins data um, that shows um, case rates in Germany and the United States. And I was in the United States in DC for those first two purple bumps um, in the beginning of 2020 um, and then moved to Germany for school um, when you see that first significant green bump um, over there in about October of 2020. Um, so I also, I also made another trip back to the United States in that second really big purple bump in September 2021. So I'm not the best good luck charm, uh, <laughs> but I follow all precautions to the letter um, as, as any good German American enthusiast does. <laughs> um, so, so this is um, a, a few pictures I took and then the New York Times' famous front page from May 24th, 2020. Um, marking the, the 100,000 death mark and the 200,000 death mark um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And these were really some of the last public expressions of grief and memory that, um, that I, I'm aware of happening in the United States. Um, I, I saved the New York Times front page when it came out without really knowing why. And then I realized later on that it was the sense that, you know, this moment of, of memory is fleeting. Um, and, and by the 200,000 dead moment, this was a, this was a crowd, um, this was a grassroots campaign, not organized by any official um, group, um, but, but people just took it upon themselves to, to make these signs and bring these flags out. So then I moved to Germany. Um, Immediately afterwards, while I was in quarantine, um, President Trump got COVID um, during the, the, the final run up to a very dramatic election in the US in 2020. Um, and at the same time, uh, I was getting used to the German spin on social distancing rules um, and communicating with the public um, in, um, in situations like taking the U-Bahn. Um, and then also in Berlin, there's a lot of communication via graffiti. So there were, there were lots of graffiti, um, stickers, um, kind of a public conversation happening on the streets about um, are, are we approaching the situation with solidarity? Are we letting it divide us, et cetera? Um, 
one thing that was really amazing was how quickly um, rapid testing, burger testing was set, stood up in Berlin. Um, and that's something that, um, that I was sorry to feel um, that my friends and family in the US didn't have as ready access to and still don't have today. Um, initially, the, the vaccination campaign in Germany and in the EU was seen as slower to get off the ground um, than the vaccination campaign in the United States. Over here, you see pictures of the front pages on the day that safety concerns about AstraZeneca were flagged. Um, but ultimately, things picked up. Um, I got three vaccines, each a different kind. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Germany and the EU. Um, and you see some of that positive messaging there um, about um, celebrating being vaccinated. Then I went back to the United States where what initially had been a really strong vaccination campaign had hit a wall um, in terms of the number of people who were interested and willing um, to be vaccinated um, and where there were rapid tests available but much more expensive and more difficult to find but where as of last summer, even the Boston Tea Party Museum was encouraging uh, visitors to wear face coverings per CDC recommendations. Then of course, we had a German federal election at the end of September, 2021, um, which coincided with wh what I perceive as kind of a, a growing frustration among the public with uh, strict restrictions on movement and on vaccination requirements. Um, and so we've seen the political um, kind of fallout from that. Um, but before we talk about how the public has perceived uh, public health communication during COVID, I just wanna talk generally about what public health communication is um, in theory versus in practice. So one of the reasons I decided to, um, to learn more about academia through, through joining and participating in it is that I had the sense as a public health communicator that there's a lot of really good information out there that people who are in public facing jobs need to know. Um, but I don't think that there's a formalized way of getting kind of the too long didn't read takeaway messages to those communicators, at least in the United States. Um, there, there are a number of reasons for that. At the national level, um, one, one thing that I do want to point out is that my experience at the United States Health and Human Services Department was that um, the most senior communicators are political appointees. Um, and in Germany, um, at the BMG, I once had the opportunity to sit down uh, with Jens Spahn's chief of staff, who, who was then who was then leading um, the ministry, and I just sort of assumed I said, "So you must be a political appointee," um, and and that's kind of an important distinction in the U.S. Are you a civil servant or a member of the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration? And he said, "No, I'm not. I'm a civil servant." And in the U.S., he and kind of three layers below him would be political appointees who might be coming in and out every four years. Um, and that includes people who are responsible for a lot of public health communications decisions. So I think that's one structural element. But I also think that there's kind of a broader need that I see in the US and Germany um, and globally for some kind of clearinghouse for all of the learnings that we have, not only from our experience with COVID-19 so far, but from past campaigns, we have passed global vaccination campaigns, therapeutics campaigns. We, this isn't a mystery what, what moves people um, and what helps people in times of crisis, but we need to empower public health communicators um, who are, um, uh, who, who, there are more of us than ever, I think, <laughs> in the aftermath of the pandemic um, to, ha to have this information. So now I want to talk a little bit about public opinion um, in Germany and the US um, about how we've done so far communicating um, on a national level about the COVID-19 pandemic. And here is uh, tracking data um, showing the German public's uh, satisfaction with the federal government's response to COVID. Um, and you see at first a pretty positive 
uh, reception then um, in January 2021, when I mentioned the vaccination campaign um, struggled to get off the ground, you see that flip. And although we've had ups and downs since, it, we haven't recovered in terms of having a majority of the population satisfied um, with the performance of the crisis management uh, done by uh, the, the federal government. And when you dig into why that is and what areas in particular um, are causing this dissatisfaction, you see that there's frustration about um, in an inability to present data clearly. And then number two, um, overall crisis communication, 21.6% uh, uh, reporting that that's a frustration for them. And in the US, you see a similar story. This is slightly older data from the end of January, 2022, um, collected by the Pew Research Center. Um, and you see a change in a negative direction in terms of people saying they're happy with public health information that's being provided to them. But you see increased numbers saying that they are wondering if public health officials are holding back it, important information or they're feeling less confident in public health officials' recommendations. And then overall, and I think this is a really important takeaway for all of us, um, six out of 10 people saying they're just confused at this point. You also see declining trust um, in all parties um, who are involved in dealing with the COVID response in the US, but particularly sharp at negative 10 points um, since August, 2021 is satisfaction with public health officials such as those at the CDC. Um, and these are our non-political public health messengers at, at a national level in the US. So this is really concerning, um, not only for the COVID response, but for overall public health and all the, the many other things that um, that the CDC needs to do and public health officials need to do in the US. But still, you can see that um, at ending up there at 50% of um, adults saying CDC is doing an excellent job dealing with the COVID outbreak. Um, that's still a higher um, percentage than we're are satisfied um, with, with either President um, Joe Biden or formerly Donald Trump. Um, and you see that the highest level of support is for the local institutions, the hospitals and medical centers um, in people's areas. So I wanna use that as a moment to segue into talking about what messages we are sending because we, we hear that the public is confused. Um, and I wanna zoom in on a few kind of subsets of the public and ask what we're saying to them. And the first one is really important to me because I work with the Infectious Diseases Society of America and with a bunch of doctors and have worked kind of daily throughout this pandemic with them. And I've seen that it has taken a toll on everybody. And so to the left here, you see this advertisement from December, 2021 that ran in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And it says, we're heartbroken, we're overwhelmed. And it, it's signed by all of the major hospitals um, in the area. And it's asking people, get vaccinated, get tested, wear a mask. And I think that that language speaks to the fact that the early public commendation of healthcare workers and frontline workers in the US has really given way to politicization um, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers have been targets of myths and disinformation. And that's related to major issues that we're seeing with burnout and turnover and early retirement. So one question I think we need to ask ourselves um, on both a policy level and a communication level is how can we better support healthcare workers um, at this moment of the pandemic that's maybe even more difficult for them than December, 2021, because you see in the US as well as in Germany, a real turn in terms of how we're talking publicly about the pandemic and the kinds of um, restrictions that the public is perceived as willing to accept. And so that's one question. 
I hope we can discuss further. And I know that Dr. Lur is gonna address as well. The other question I wanna ask, um, and this is taking a much broader view, um, is what message we're sending to world leaders in the global public in our global response to the COVID-19 crisis. And I think that this is a really important issue for us um, in the transatlantic community to think about because the US and Germany are, are or have been or are supposed to be two of our leading champions and defenders of liberal de democratic ideals and also of the international system, um, the UN, the WHO. And here you see a graph showing that <laughs> the low income countries um, have received um, vac vaccination supplies, which are part, but not all of a vaccination campaign, which of, of course also involves public health communication very prominently. Um, but you see that that bottom uh, low income category is on track if current first dose administration rates are maintained to remain pretty much flat, um, only ticking up a little bit through the end of the year. Um, and that means that there's really no chance of meeting the UN General Assembly and WHO goal of 70% vaccination in 2022. And we have really new promising new therapeutics, therapeutics like Paxlovid and Molnupiravir that have been proven um, to be effective in reducing morbidity and mortality. And it looks like distribution there is gonna follow the same inequitable path. So I want to um, emphasize that this is an issue for us um, that we should all be thinking about as well. So overall, there is a need for a, a robust global public health communications infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, more people than ever before are public health communicators. I think we all know someone who works in a field that has nothing to do with healthcare that's been assigned or deputized as the COVID guidelines person and the COVID response person. Um, and so I also wanna talk about possible solutions to get actionable information uh, into those hands. And something that I discovered um, in my research for this is this amazing report um, called Democratic Health Communications During COVID-19 um, that came out in September, 2020 and that I wish I had found out about before um, whatever month this is, May 2022, um, because it has a lot of great advice. Um, and it kind of offers a proactive counterpoint to a style of politics that um, a medical anthropologist in the Philippines called Gideon Lasco has identified, which is medical populism. Um, and this is um, something he identified in Brazil, the Philippines, and the US that involves simplification of the pandemic, dramatization of the crisis using language related to war and emergencies, forging of divisions, and invocation of knowledge claims. So a positive democratic public health communications agenda would not use that kind of approach, but would frame prevention behaviors as democratic, um, remind citizens of their freedoms and responsibilities, communicate values, um, and draw upon relevant national histories. Um, the, the, this is from that report, and they also um, propose a potential national pandemic communications unit. I think that we should think even bigger um, and think about how we can build a global communications infrastructure that supports good public health communication and democratic public health communication, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also during future pandemics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for this uh, insightful presentation. And I uh, really like how you started it off uh, by reminding everybody that we're all part of this and we all have our unique experiences and our own unique opinions about how, how this pandemic has been handled by our uh, leaders. So I'll turn it over to Katrin now. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you all, Jeff, Liz, and Marjorie. Uh, I'm also excited to be here, uh, kind of back in DC, not really, but <laughs> at least virtually. And so I will um, start my presentation and uh, jump into it. I hope you can all see my slides. I will start the presentation mode now. Can you just give me um, 
um, a verbal sign because I don't see you anymore. Can you see the slide? Yes. 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 We can. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Great. Um, yes, I'm um, um, focusing on on a kind of political science um, view on this debate, um, and I um, yeah I see some. I think uh, there are some similarities to what Marjorie also already said and some perspectives now um, I will show you um, on the public administration and public policy uh, part of this um, situation. And um, my headline is expert, experts all around us, uh, scientific advisors in health systems and their effects on policy uh, or on politics. And uh, the question is how trust can be built and how democracy can be strengthened. Uh, again, maybe re-strengthened um, in, in times of crisis and especially in this kind of crisis. So um, there are of course different ways to involve experts. And there was a big or a huge need to involve experts in this very specific situation or a very um, um, new and um, acute situation starting in March 2020, around uh, March, February, a little bit earlier maybe. And um, I think there were in the early parts, there were maybe similar um, developments in different countries. However, I, I'm now focusing especially on the German situation and how things developed in Germany. Uh, and I will have three different uh, levels I will focus on. But first of all, I will give you a picture as well. And maybe you who are familiar with the situation in, in Germany know about this demonstrations and um, these campaigns of people uh, who are called Querdenker or um, sometimes there are other groups that regularly go um, and demonstrate against vaccination, against all the interventions that are made uh, with regard to the pandemic. And here the sign says, uh, who is sleeping or who sleeps in democracy will uh, wake up in, in a dictatorship. So there are some people who say that everything that is done and especially with regard to vaccination uh, is uh, a sign of, uh, having a dictatorship and losing democratic institutions, losing democratic um, um, facets of this German political system. Um, it is uh, a, a not a very, very huge group. It's not the majority. And the last election has shown that there is a big support or at least a, um, um, yeah, a support that is big enough for strengthening uh, democratic institutions in Germany and especially the big parties, uh, democratic parties. Um, there is also a cleavage in society and there are some, uh, of course, on the personal level, there are some issues coming up in families and uh, in neighborhoods where people are fighting or are not talking to each other anymore. And this has to do with the view on this pandemic and especially with everything that was done or is done uh, to prevent. And um, I would say, and this is in line with what, what Marjorie showed us, in, in the first uh, phase, there was a broad consent or at least a, a, a consent that was huge enough with regard to early policies for COVID-19 prevention. But this turned uh, later into an overheated debate with regard to the interventions. It has also, of course, to do with uh, different kinds of regulations in the German federal states, uh, which was, uh, this is a typical uh, thing to look at in Germany and uh, a typical kind of um, not being um, very happy with the situation, at least, uh, or especially if you live at the border of two different lenders, then you see the differences between, for example, Lower Saxony and Northern Westphalia, and then people are not really understanding why there is a difference in, in the rules. So uh, this was one aspect, but also, of course, the question um, how uh, freedom and uh, this um, yeah, features of libertarian democracies uh, are um, restricted and uh, what we want to accept or what not. 
And there's of course political resistance. Um, however, it turned into an anti-science skepticism in parts of society. And this is what I will focus on now, this question how experts are involved and what it, uh, what, what the results were with regard to public trust and uh, with regard to uh, democratic um, perception or uh, democratic convictions. So we still see some demonstrations not as huge or as offensive as they were, but still there are demonstrations, there are still there are political attacks and the um, and it's just a few weeks ago that the uh, federal, uh, the minister Lauterbach was, um, or that um, um, the security um, uh, showed that there were, there were some attacks planned uh, against Lauterbach. So there is a mistrust towards expertise, towards uh, political uh, actors as well. So I talked about three different spheres. And the first sphere I see is kind of expert advisory system. Here in the picture, you see Jens Spahn, who Marjorie talked about, who was the um, Minister of Health in Germany until uh, 2000 uh, or until December or January when the new, um, the new government took over. But he was uh, yeah, uh, working very closely together with Christian Drosten and other experts. Um, and there was a kind of, um, in a positive way, we could say a very flexible way of introducing or uh, integrating experts into the sphere of political um, actors, into the sphere of governance or government. Um, and uh, I will come to that later, what the characteristics of this kind of expert advisory systems were. And maybe we can then later discuss what effect it has. And I will give you some ideas on that as well. And then there is a, a second um, aspect, and this is more the institutional side of it, uh, especially the Robert Koch Institute, which is a very traditional old institute, institutionalized um, infrastructure for everything that has to do with uh, infections and um, prevention policies. And it's also, it's a research uh, institute, but especially also uh, an institute for consulting the government and for uh, all kinds of uh, communications and uh, also this um, um, safety issues uh, with regard to vaccination and other uh, spheres of the medical system. So this is a uh, traditional, uh, long established institutionalized structure we find in Germany, which is, in my view, a little bit different from this ad hoc advisory system I uh, showed you before. And then there's this third level, I think, and this is the um, sphere of the uh, family doctors and the uh, all this kind of medical professionals on the um, uh, individual level and Marjorie talked about that as well and I think there's a big or uh, huge support for them and also um, and I come to that in a minute uh, there's trust towards this kind of um, people of experts as well they are of course experts in the medical system as well but they um, have a different function or a different role in the system and of course they are not consulting the government um, however, there are structures in Germany um, with uh, associations and uh, ways of advocacy uh, regimes uh, from this sphere of medical professionalists uh, and medical doctors as well. So we have the three levels or the three, uh, three spheres um, in this expert advisory system. And now um, I will come to kind of um, classification um, how we can um, talk about this with regard to trust and to this perception in the public. So this is not this expert uh, system or this part of the expert system I showed you with this uh, experts like Dosten and others. It's not an established structure of advisory, it's more ad hoc. And there were some prominent experts and there are um, studies out there that showed that 
there is a big debate in public health that, of course, that was not a pluralistic way of inter, um, integrating expertise from the field. And this is also something that uh, professional um, people from this sphere of public health um, uh, argue about that it was or it would be necessary in the future to have more kind of pluralistic ways to uh, cooperate, collaborate, and consult governments uh, with regard uh, to such situations and with regards, of course, to designing interventions and everything that has to do with uh, the pandemic. Then there was the role of the media. Maybe you are familiar with what uh, people like Rosten did with podcasts. They worked together with um, the public um, media stations. And this um, was, of course, a big support uh, as well for everybody. And uh, I think there is a majority of people who trust these kind of um, media uh, system and, and the uh, supply of information that came from that uh, sphere. However, it is, of course, not um, institutionalized in a way that uh, you really know um, who is behind it. So um, there were, of course, people questioning it. And it is, of course, in contrast to everything that is in social media, for example, around. And some people are uh, have difficulties to uh, differentiate between the sources that are there for information. And that's what Marjorie as well um, pointed to, this kind of uh, way how what what kind of information or um, communication um, is there there were some discursive dynamics you know about this all this kind of theory and, and things that are around there and um, and there is uh, with regard to the intervention uh, sometimes there was uh, this link that government has um, um, yeah they they uh, they try to um, make some foundations in expertise uh, to justify what they did in interventions. And this is, of course, something that uh, uh, weakens the, uh, the, the experts as well. And sometimes there was missing transparency, clarity, uh, clarity and incomprehensibility uh, with regard to the interventions. So um, then when we look at this Robert Koch Institute, there was a big way of personalizing this um, in, uh, institutionalized uh, role with Lothar Wieler. He's the head of this institute, which is, of course, necessary, of course, and he was the major consultant for the government. However, of course, here as well, it's, it's kind of focused person, and uh, this is um, a threat to uh, trust as well if these uh, um, recommendations that he made led to specific interventions that people found to, to be too strict, for example. Um, but sometimes there was also um, non-coherence, so the policy interventions didn't follow the policy advice that came from this traditional and institutionalized um, structure. So this is, of course, a very tricky thing if uh, politics uh, differ from what comes from this uh, established and uh, highly reputed uh, institution. And on a practical uh, uh, side, there were infrastructural challenges as well uh, with regard to data, communication strategies and equipment, and es especially because the Robert Koch Institute is absolutely dependent on the data they got from the so-called öffentliche Gesundheitsdienst, that is a public uh, health service. We, we don't have a, a real public health service with, with regard to healthcare, as you might know, but there's this um, Gesundheitsämter, so there's on the local level, the structure of institutions that, um, that uh, collect the data about uh, infections, for example. And there was a big uh, problem with um, data transfer, data collecting first, and then data transfer, and there's still some problems uh, for the RKI, uh, RKI, uh, RKI, RKI in, in English, so the Robert Koch Institute to, um, to have this data available. And now the third um, 
sphere, the, um, the experts on the local level, I think that this is a very um, um, stable system of experts and they have a good role or an established role for the vaccination campaign as well. Um, but um, I would argue that for the main public, they are not identified or perceived as part of the expert advisory system and they are far away from what government does. So it is difficult to have them being the, the, uh, um, the main actors for uh, building trust in the health system or in, with regard to pandemic policies. So what uh, some, some ideas for future outlook, what does it mean for transatlantic partnership now? So with regard to the scientific community, if you remember the picture of Christian Drosten and all the experts that are around, it's of course not only him and there are other disciplines as well. I would argue that we need uh, to strengthen a strong international scientific community. There is of course uh, already an international scientific community. It has nothing to do with this current pandemic, but there is a, it is internationally, of course, the whole medical system and public health system as well. Um, probably it could be an idea to strengthen that even more and to support this kind of community building to learn from each other, use established forms of collaboration, but also build up new forms with regard to specific topics, which, which we now have learned during the pandemic. And especially what Marjorie says, uh, public health communication, but also use of data, future re research as well. First step. The second is um, with regard to the institutional advisory system, and you remember the Robert Koch Institute, but also others. I would say there's a need for closer institutional exchange, and I try to find out, and it's really not possible to find something um, uh, really fundamental or very, very um, foundational, which shows that there is a, a, a big uh, partnership between these institutes, which would, of course, be helpful probably, but also needed to, to learn from each other. Um, there, are, there are some papers around who, who talked about this kind of peer-to-peer -peer collaborations between institutes, which is moderated by the um, WHO. Uh, but I think it's in the, in the uh, early steps. Um, so there's need for closer cooperation and maybe new transdisciplinary transatlantic collaborations. And maybe you have heard about the new uh, uh, WHO hub in Germany, uh, which was uh, um, established in September, 2021. It's quite new and it's it is seen as a, an incubator, incubator for future uh, collaboration in this field. And the next, uh, the last step is probably the most difficult one if there is a, a perspective for transatlantic partnership on this local level. I think that is the most challenging thing because all these people that work there have a lot of things to do uh, uh, already, but uh, maybe there is an idea for personal exchange or maybe digital platforms can be used for knowledge transfer to learn from each other. And my last slide is uh, about some lessons and shared experiences we can maybe look uh, or discuss if there is a, a, a possibility to re-strengthening trust by um, rebalancing these systems, building up strategies for communication, um, and also uh, the role of experts which can be debated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrin, for this comprehensive report on um, some of the German issues vis-a-vis -vis trust in, in public health expertise. And I wanted to ask Marjorie if you uh, would like to respond to, to Katrin's presentation, if you have some thoughts. Yeah, first of all, I find it kind of quite remarkable and exciting quite similar in terms of, of what needs to be done, strengthening international cooperation, um, both in the academic and scientific community, but also on that institutional level. 
Um, I had an interesting experience, I guess, when I was working in the bilateral relations department of the BMJ, uh, where they kind of have different, differently sized binders for each country they work with um, based on the scope of the work. And some countries even have two or three binders, but I was not encouraged to find that the US binder is it, it's there, but it's it's rather small. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity um, considering that we face a lot of the same challenges, um, even though our, our health systems are, are so different um, for, for direct bilateral cooperation. Um, I, think, I think that that would be a fantastic thing in addition to the kind of international collaboration that something like the WHO hub um, could facilitate. Um, I also just kind of another striking and interesting parallel um, to the German and American cases are the, the first element of the expert advisory system on um, these kind of health policy celebrities that have emerged <laughs> um, here with Lothar Wheeler um, in the US uh, with Anthony Fauci, um, the kind of people, doctors, I, I know doctors and public health officials who used to have like a hundred followers and have a hundred thousand followers now. So kind of seeing the value of these people as communicators while also um, making sure that, um, that we're aware of some of the risks too of having this totally different um, information ecosystem through which we're communicating information and all of the problems um, and opportunities that things like the new reliance on preprints um, and everything presents. These are, these are health communications opportunities and challenges that I think we have in common. Um, and so I'd be interested to talk a little more about, about kind of the personalization of, of health communications. Um, but overall, yeah, just kind of encouraging to see that, to see that um, the reads are the same in terms of where we go next. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, Kathleen, do you have any comments uh, initially or should we turn it, yeah, turn it, it over um, to uh, some just questions? A just a short one um, because I'm interested in the questions as well. What I found interesting, Marjorie, what you, uh, what you presented to us to this uh, kind of how the Germans um, evaluate or evaluate this uh, situation and what uh, for me was interesting is to see that this personal um, situation like the economic system social and the kind of uh, uh, supply they get is not uh, evaluated um, as a bad or bad situation it is just the communication and data and the question is has it really an effect for them for their everyday life? And why is it so big and important with regard to trust to expertise? Because their everyday situation is not so bad. So this is just maybe an open question and maybe interesting to see if there's a difference to the US as well. Great. So uh, a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, I wanted to ask or, or address the issue of uh, the threat to democracy. You just, I think Marjorie mentioned it a little bit, certainly in her, her paper, but it seems that uh, the public on both sides of the Atlantic. Initially, they were happy with how their, their political leaders handled and, and the healthcare officials handled the pandemic. And uh, but then this, this dropped off dramatically in both countries. And, and there is some, some people think this is really threatening to our democratic institutions, the lack of trust in the healthcare sectors and our public officials. But isn't it also a sign that democracy is working because people go demonstrate. They, they're not afraid to, to voice their dissent. And this is certainly not possible in countries like China and Russia, who in China, as we, we know, they initially in the first year 
and a half of the pandemic, they made it clear that their system is better because they they have a firm hold on how the pandemic is is going, and that's of course changed dramatically. So they have to change their their public uh, face a little bit, but there are no demonstrations because it's simply not allowed. So how do you see this uh, this influence on on our democratic societies? I'd be happy to take that first. Um, and I, I want to just kind of clarify that, um, you know, clearly the US and, the, and Germany are, are, are liberal democracies, um, even though I'd say that the US is struggling um, with democratic backsliding to, to a much greater extent um, th than Germany. Um, and so I think it's about how do we move both the democratic ball forward and the public health communications ball forward at the same time and in a mutually reinforcing way. Um, and so, so I think it might be helpful just to, to clarify a little bit also around what is democratic communications? What, what, is, what do democratic health communications look like? And I think the first big element of it is empowerment, empowering people with the information they need to act and protect themselves. And that information is going to change as information knowledge changes, as the virus changes, as the pandemic changes. So it's not just about accurate and digestible information that's accessible, but it's also about evolving information and evolving communications. Um, I, I was recently uh, on a, I, I had to fly uh, across the ocean <laughs> transatlantically uh, on Lufthansa and people in the, 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 the tube that you're in to get on the plane were kind of, everyone was pointing and laughing at these signs that say, keep six feet apart because no one's, no one's six feet apart. There's no expectation really at this point on um, that, that we're gonna stay six feet apart. So I think it's also kind of a responsibility, not only if, if you put the poster up, then at the right time, you need to also take the poster down and, and refresh the information that you're providing, whether you're a local business or you're a school or you're a government. Um, and so I think empowering people with that timely and actionable information is one element of it. And the other element of it is what values are we drawing on and framing um, these discussions and our obligations to each other um, Using and I think that the the um, report that I pointed to in my presentation does a really good job of saying, hey, instead of framing this as a war, why don't we frame it as a natural disaster? Instead of creating enemies, why don't we identify that this is a virus, and no matter how angry we get at it, that's not going to be this be the step or the response or the reaction that's going to get us to a productive solution. Um, and I think that also kind of our responsibility as 21st century democratic communicators is to harness new technologies, new ways that people are conversing, not only to deliver messages to the public, but also to listen and to, to use kind of these, these newly advancing learning techniques to say, is the message getting through? How can we revise it on the fly? And how can we continue to innovate and evolve on to keep this a conversation instead of a one-way street. Catherine, do you have any uh, response? Yeah, maybe uh, uh, just to, to add up on it, uh, I think this what Mattery also uh, pointed to is uh, the, the need for uh, understanding how science works and uh, that science is not something that, like, that you have a scientific result and then that is fixed and and uh, carved in stone and everything now is clear so this is like i think a challenge for lots of people that it's as you said it evolving and it's empowering not only to digest information but to um to yeah get along with the challenge of uh, changing developments and this is what is I think uh, a threat to lots of people that there's no stability in what we can rely on. And this is uh, something that is not possible for politics or democracies to solve, but maybe it's a, um, a need for uh, 
for education and for educational systems to strengthen people in getting along with this situation of um, science that is not not something that is stable or uh, just stopping anywhere but already and, and especially in a pandemic uh, that is all always uh, developing thank you Kathleen. i also there's a question about uh, the role of the individual healthcare expert are our doctors. And I think that's very similar in the US. There's a lot of trust in, in the, the primary care doctors in hospitals. Marjorie showed the, the survey that people trust in hospitals in, in the healthcare workers, although I think many of them have have experienced uh, the opposite. And that also in part has led to to the burnout and many healthcare professionals leaving their jobs. But uh, how can, do you see a way to, to increase the influence of these, these personal care doctors and uh, without giving them a public platform because that seems to then go into the, the other direction, but uh, how, and I, I like Katrin's uh, recommendation that there are to, to uh, institute person to person exchanges across the Atlantic between these doctors. But uh, if you'd like to comment on that, both of you. Yeah, I, I, I could start. Maybe there could be a kind of um, um, corresponding system of um, public policy, public policy communication, and these experts on the field, like uh, the medical doctors, who are backed up by that all, all, others, uh, all other actors showed the public that this is the, in, the, these are the persons they can trust, and that there's a communication between the spheres. So that there's uh, that people can see that there is a network of people working together in favor of uh, our all health and in favor of public health. So that there's not this big divide between these different systems. Maybe this could be an idea to to strengthen the role. And maybe if uh, they are shown as being the experts that help people on the individual level and they can trust them and they can rely on them. That could be a way forward. Uh, however, in Germany, I don't know if it's the same in, in, in the US. Um, there are, of course, some parts uh, or there are um, doctors that are opponents of the political sphere. So this is, of course, a challenge as well if there are milieus or um, groups of people that counter uh, the the ideas that are followed by the government, for example. Yeah, okay. I, I think I th um, in my in my work on the pandemic, I, I've worked on a website that's kind of like a hub for doctors from different specialties to share learnings about COVID nineteen and also to share resources, um, especially communications resources, because we know that um, doctors are such credible and trusted messengers. Um, but even though that's, I think, a really important um, and ongoing need to be disseminating this information um, to doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals to, to disseminate, disseminate it onto their communities, I don't think we should look at this data and say, well, doctors and hospitals are trusted um, and public health officials are trusted less. So we, we're going to have doctors take on that role because doctors are tired. Doctors are overworked. Um, and some choose to take on that role and some choose to do, you know, a full day at the clinic and then get on CNN and then tweet. Um, but I think a lot of, a lot of our health professionals need a break and we need to um, say as, as public health communications um, professionals who don't have that MD what are we going to do to enhance our credibility and to, and to share some of that load? Great, thank you. Maybe just one final question about the responsibility of Germany and the United States as liberal democracy. 
democracies to to move forward this idea of global equity in terms of access to COVID vaccines and uh, med antiviral medicines, et cetera. Is, that, is there among the, the public, do you think in Germany and the US, is this something the public is concerned about? You, I don't think you hear very much about it. It's not a focus in communication in either country, but I could be wrong. So final comments. Um, I, as a student at Humboldt University, I've, I've become a member of this cool group called Universities Allied for Essential Medicine that works with groups like Oxfam um, and others who have really led the, the global fight for vaccine equity. And, and it's a fight that um, has been up against a lot from the start. Um, but I think that if you look at public polling, and I, I'm happy to follow up on this because I don't have it at my fingers. Um, and if you look at the initial reactions from everybody, fr from world leaders, international leaders, companies, um, what we were saying in the early months of the pandemic before we actually had these vaccines and we actually had citizens demanding vaccines for themselves um, is that there was the idea that we were gonna be committed to equity and that these were medical miracles that we were gonna share with the world the way that we've done in the past. Um, and so far in practice that hasn't matched. And I think to whatever extent people aren't upset about it, that's a failing of, um, of us as activists and as political um, as political actors, um, not to make it a, a big deal because it really is. Yes, and I think, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think there, there's need to really speed up this situation with regards to uh, collaboration and uh, maybe this we, uh, WHO hub can be one institution that uh, fosters this idea. And, uh, but of course, as Madri says, as, uh, there was a big focus first on like me first or my nation first and then uh, now, but nowadays, I think it's a, also a logistic issue and a kind of sometimes really practical um, issue. And there's there are these different spheres of practical organizational uh, issues and, of course, the political uh, collaboration. And this is something we need to learn from the pandemic as well, uh, not only with regard to the national systems, but also with international cooperation. Yeah. Well, we've come to an end, uh, unfortunately. I want to thank both Katrin and Marjorie for their insights and expertise. It's been a real pleasure and the conversation will no doubt continue on this, this topic. Uh, there's so many issues that uh, deal with COVID in, in our societies. And also Katrin and Marjorie are have written two articles on this issue. Both will be published on our website in the next few days. So I encourage everybody to take a look. And thank you all for joining and have a wonderful rest of the day and see you again soon at ASCGS. Bye-bye.